You guys know the story about Nero, right? You know, his father Claudius was poisoned with an Ammonita and Nero took over and sort of the end of the Roman Empire. So we have that sort of deep ingrained in us. The cells of a fungus are called hyphae, and these structures are like tubes. These tubes allow the fungus to colonize, to grow in different environments. When you have a number of hyphae together, that is what we call a mycelium. And this is the body of the fungus. And that mushroom is the one that carries the spores of the fungus that will be dispersed in the environment, sometimes by wind, sometimes by water, sometimes by other organisms. So the fungus, they are able to release millions of spores, right? And these spores can be taken up by the wind and moved to very far away places. Fungus, I think that is one of the worries about climate change, that we're seeing these new organisms because we might not have seen them, or things that have been there that have not really been active but because now they're in, in an environment that is much more beneficial, they'll start, you know, dividing and growing. I think it's at the heart of evolution of everything, but um, fungi, what sets them, so they're very similar to animals in that both animals and fungi can't make our own food. We have to get it from some other source. But of course, animals can run around. We bring our food inside to digest. Fungi can't do that. They're really not that fast. So what they end up doing is digesting whatever they're laying in. So they put their enzymes outside them, digest what they're laying in, that's called the substrate, and then bring that into them, whether that substrate's the inside of an insect body or a piece of wood or whatever. And so they can adapt to different environments just by changing the sorts of these metabolites, these enzymes that they can produce to degrade the substrates that they're in. That's one way that they can adapt to their environment. Like your skin, you know, that can be a substrate for a fungus. It can land on that and start releasing enzymes that break down proteins and fats, and, and then that is part of your tissue. So it starts breaking it down, uh, and those molecules that are released, it's gonna absorb that and use those as food to grow and, and divide. They could grow in materials, actually, that it's hard to even think that microorganisms can grow on, including plastic or hydrocarbons that are very complex, that are pollutants. And the fungi have the capacity to produce enzymes that can break down organic molecules into more simple molecules. Then that allows them to grow in very different environments. We have fungi that are aquatic and they can actually swim towards each other and sense each other. These aquatic fungi have flagella, so they have single cell flagella that they swim around and they look very much like sponge larva or something. They can, so they can communicate with each other. Usually it's done through pheromones. Uh, fungi that live like yeast that live on plant surfaces can sense each other and sort of hop along the surface by sending spores along to, to meet each other. And fungi that form mycelium can orient towards each other and signal that way. So they can signal to each other in the same species. They can also produce uh, chemical warfare to ward off other individuals in the microbial world that might be encroaching on their substrate. All organisms communicate from one way or another through the use of chemical signals. Fungi, through the production of their hyphae, through those tubes, as I mentioned before, that are, can be very long and can branch out, there will be molecules that travel from one place to another one in the hyphal network that will facilitate the communication of that single organism. But sometimes fungi can communicate with other fungi. And this could be through the production of different molecules. And these molecules will 
help the other organisms to know that fungus is there. Just imagine in a soil where there is a lot of competition and you have multiple different organisms, fungi sometimes will produce substances that will inhibit other organisms. Could be bacteria, could be other fungi, but also they'll produce substances that allow them to communicate with other organisms in different kingdoms. Many fungi are symbiotic organisms in plants. They live inside the roots of plants and they help plants grow. Sometimes to establish that initial relationship with the plant, the fungals will communicate with the plant using different types of molecules that will modify even the structures of the plant to allow the fungus to enter and to colonize the plant because the fungus brings benefits to that organism. Fungi are part of uh, your natural microbiome. So the microbiome, you have communities of microbes in your gut, in your mouth, and other parts of your body. And they help you with things like providing some nutrients like vitamin K in your gut. Certain fungi are probably able to provide some services to you. They're not as well studied. So cordyceps is a genus of fungi that um, infect insects primarily. And they are unique in fungi because of the way they establish infections and they are able to um, elicit certain pheromones and hormones, mimic these insect pheromones and hormones that cause alterations in the host behavior. And uh, they can cause very long-term infections in hosts, depending on the life of the host. But they've also evolved this way of allowing themselves for maximum spore dispersal, uh, which also involves altering the host behavior towards the end of infections. Cordyceps are the type of fungus and these fungi are very interesting because they are able to infect insects. For example, some cordyceps are pathogens of ants. When the ant is infected with the fungus, it will find a place in the forest where they will climb up on a tree or a branch and attach to that leaf or that branch and die in that particular place. We call those fruiting bodies, which is the part that will benefit the dispersal of the spores of the fungus. Then in a way, this fungus is altering the behavior of the ant to allow the dispersal of their spores that can go in the environment and colonize other ants. So we're talking about a, a large group of fungi. So broadly speaking, um, these things produce spores. Let's say the beginning of a life cycle is with the production of a little spore, and that spore comes in contact with the host. And they're usually very host specific. So one species of cordyceps will infect one species of a host insect. The spore comes in contact with the host, and then it penetrates and begins to fill, grow and fill the host cavity. And what's kind Kind of gruesome about cordyceps is that um, the cavity will fill with what we call mycelium, part of the cordyceps, but they will start to digest the non-essential parts of the host first, so the host can have a really long-lived <laughs> infection. And they also produce these chemical signals. Uh, they mimic pheromones and hormones produced by the host to cause alterations in the host behavior. And typically, a lot of these species towards the end of the host insect uh, infection, um, it will crawl up to a high point and sort of latch onto something with its jaws. And then the cordyceps will erupt out of it and spread spores from this high vantage point to start the cycle all over again. The rest fungi is another group. So when we talk about cordyceps, we're talking about a whole bunch of fungi. Rust fungi is a whole big group of fungi that infect plants. These are what we call obligate pathogens of plants. And as a group, they infect almost all of our most important crops. So wheat, corn, coffee, for instance. And the rust that causes a disease, these are also very host specific like our cordyceps. So there is a species of rust that infects coffee plants. Um, it was first discovered around 1870 and it took about 100 years, but it managed to get to all the places in the world where we grow coffee. And it's starting to cause very severe epidemics again now. Um, 
since 2012, uh, especially in Central America, where a lot of our coffee production, our high quality coffee production occurs. And because coffee is one of these crops that's produced by small shareholder farmers, it's not a big ag um, produced crop. These small farmers, if they lose a year's worth of crop because of infection with the rust, it can be very, very devastating socioeconomically in these countries where, where the rust is, is causing epidemics again. Our best tools for fighting coffee rust right now are trying to breed resistance into the host. But because coffee is a tree, it's a little more difficult to do this than in our grass crops like wheat, right? It's a long-term commitment to get this. And our genetic stock for, for coffee is actually quite limited. We do have chemical fungicides, but they really work best in countries where we have the infrastructure to get the fungicides out to all the small farmers and the equipment to apply them. Um, and so that doesn't work all the time. So our best defense right now is just trying to teach farmers how to recognize early signs of the disease and implement some sanitation before it takes over as an epidemic. There are only about a hundred that infect us. The most common, as I mentioned, you have uh, skin infections. So they land on your skin and they find a really nice moist area to divide and reproduce. That's how you get those skin infections. And uh, for the infections that affect your lungs or get into your body, you breathe in and so they uh, go into your respiratory tract. And sometimes when people are immunocompromised, when they have, for example, cancer, and their immune system isn't able to mount a, a protective response, then that fungus is unable to be controlled by the immune system and it enters your bloodstream or it enters deeper into tissues and divides and reproduces. So one of the ways we try to kill something that is harming us, like bacteria, fungi, or viruses, is like for fungi, they're called antifungal agents, so antibiotics that kill specifically fungi. And uh, there aren't very many of those. The reason why there aren't so many of those because the fungi, the cells are very similar to ours. So if you were trying to kill that cell, you're gonna affect your own cell. So one example of an antifungal agent is amphotericine or the azoles, and those are affecting something that isn't present in our cells. So we know that cholesterol, for example, is in all our membranes, but the yeast and the fungi don't have that. They have ergosterol. Ergosterol is chemically very similar to cholesterol. So it replaces cholesterol in a fungi, and it does the same job as cholesterol does in your cell membranes. Uh, the ergosterol is what you're uh, targeting with those antibiotics. How does the resistance to that antibiotic arise? Well, you have a population of fungi. Okay. There might be one in that population that is naturally resistant to the antifungal agent. Maybe the, the way it makes ergosterol is, is different from its neighbors. The drug is not able to affect the ergosterol. Okay. So that particular one cell is going to start dividing and growing when there is that drug present because it's the only one that's going to be able to survive. And it's going to take over, everything else will die, and it will be naturally resistant. So it, will, it can go, it can survive in the environment and go and affect other people, other hosts, other humans. We should not be afraid of mushrooms. You know, there are a few deadly poisonous mushrooms. There's deadly poisonous plants. There's deadly poisonous animals, but people are really frightened of the deadly poisonous mushrooms. There's a lot of stories about these in folklore and even in, in history. You guys know the story about Nero, right? You know, his father Claudius was poisoned with an ammonita and Nero took over sort of the end of the Roman Empire. So we have that sort of deep ingrained in us. But um, no, mushrooms are the fruits of a fungus. 
So we talked about mycelium. That's actually the body, what we call a thallus. The mushroom is the fruit, just like an apple or something. So that's the reproductive structure. The fruits, the mushrooms, the fungi that form mushroom fruits are all doing good things in the ecosystem. Even if the fruit might be poisonous to us, it is either symbiotic with the tree and the trees can't grow without it, or it is decomposing dead matter in the soil and making that a much more enriched organic environment. So they're doing great things. Uh, and I, yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I'm That's sorry, perfect. you guys. Okay.